Newspapers all over the world are struggling, but there is one very notable exception, the Financial Times, which has successfully shifted from a business model relying on selling physical newspapers to selling digital subscriptions to an increasingly global audience, becoming the most popular newspaper among business people and world leaders alike in just two decades. So, how did the Financial Times make the transition from printed UK-focused newspaper to becoming the digital global powerhouse that it is today? And how was it able to make so much money without sacrificing quality journalism? Well, luckily, at the Warwick Economics Summit 2024, I had the opportunity to talk to the CEO of the Financial Times, John Ridding, about precisely these questions. And I'm happy to say that he really gave me some interesting insights about how data is the real benefit of having paid members and how the paper was able to resist the trend of increased sensationalism in the media. So, without further ado, here's my in-depth conversation with John Ridding from the Financial Times. All right, John, welcome to uh, Money and Macro Talks. Uh, I'm very happy that you were willing to talk to me about uh, the company that you are working for, the Financial Times, which also happens to be uh, my favorite newspaper uh, and <laughs> one that I'm uh, increasingly reading, uh, no longer uh, as physical paper, but rather uh, on my phone. And uh, I've been told that you have been a major figure uh, sort of guiding the FT through this process uh, for the last you know, more than a decade, yes. uh, I would think. Yeah. And so uh, my first question to you would be sort of, um, can you take us back to, to that time, uh, like uh, well, let's say 18 years ago or something? Because yeah, for us it's very normal to, to read on our phone, to have a, maybe a mobile subscription, but at the time it really wasn't. And um, I just wonder, you know, what was that like? And you know, from maybe a personal perspective, but also from, especially from, from a business perspective. Sir. Sure, well, thank you for having me, Yori, and I'm delighted that you're a, an FT loyalist. Um, and it has been quite the journey from print to, um, mainly digital, um, and I would like to say that it was part of a sort of initially part of a um, long-term, well-researched, well-thought-through transition. But really, initially, uh, it was partly um, based on urgency and instinct. So I guess back at the in the early two thousands, the uh, environment for print newspaper was becoming extremely tough. Um, the arrival of big tech and digital channels, the decline of print advertising, really meant in a sense that our platform was burning. So we had to do something fairly urgent and we decided to do two things. Um, one was to embrace digital transformation, digital disruption, uh, and two was rethink our pricing strategy. And, and both at the time were very controversial. In particular, the idea we had, um, which my strong belief was that quality journalism is valuable information worth paying for. And in those days, actually, there'd been a sort of commoditization of quality news that the, the big print barons had basically discounted quite aggressively. So you had this really difficult environment for, for news. Um, a lot of news organizations decided to cut costs in the face of that um, to try and keep uh, in the black. And our view was actually to be confident about our journalism um, and in print to increase our prices and also to move into digital where we would also charge a subscription, which at the time was quite radical. And I remember going to the west coast of the, the US and was giving a talk um, and came under some pretty fierce criticism because the idea at the time or the, the sort of conventional wisdom was this slogan, um, the internet is free or the internet wants to be free, which was kind of like weird because the internet doesn't want anything. <laughs> it's a channel. Um, and I think, you know, the idea is that people wanted things, not unreasonably to be free online, you know, be nice. But we had to run a global organization of very high quality journalism, which requires a lot of investment. So we decided to charge subscriptions um, and that began to work. And I think the, but the really interesting thing was we started really charging for journalism online because we needed revenues, because print advertising was falling very steeply. But what we didn't realize at the time was that the real value came from uh, the data that we got okay, from our readers, yeah. because print is a wonderful format. I love print. I was just reading it on the train on the way here. But it's fairly anonymous, whereas with digital channels, you understand 
a huge amount about what readers are reading, how long they're reading, what subjects they're interested in. And it really created this um, business model of um, data, data informed um, business decisions and how we could develop the FT and that the science and art of engaging readers and then locking them in, making them become ever more loyal, being ever more relevant to them, uh, which also gives you pricing power, et cetera. So you create this virtuous circle yeah. um, of readers becoming ever more engaged. Um, you become ever more must have. You have more um, freedom to price appropriately to, yeah. <laughs> to run what is a very expensive operation because journalism is not cheap. So that was really the, the key dynamics of the change. Um, and that continues to go from strength to strength. I suppose the other dimension in the digital transformation is there's been this um, wonderful creative expansion of channels because obviously uh, we now do audio, video, film. There's lots of new formats, data journalism, data visualization, lots of dynamic new ways of reaching uh, readers. So I actually think that's very interesting because that's something I didn't come across before. Like you mentioned this, that the, the value was in the data. Mm. Um, yeah, because it's like it's the, um, you know, if you read about the success of the Financial Times in, the, in its transformation to the digital era, you really read mostly about sort of the success of the subscription-based model because it gives you this recurring revenue and stability yes. and all yes. of that. But I've never heard that before. And, and it actually uh, makes sense to me given that sort of, you know, I operate on YouTube. Mm -hmm. where uh, Google has provided this wonderful dashboard yes. uh, with a lot of statistics like saying, oh, at this point, um, your viewers stop watching or <laughs> huh, this is your most popular video. Yeah. Or, and that is something I never considered. But you, yeah. of course, all have all of that in-house now, right? So yeah. you can see, oh, this article, here they stopped reading. Yeah. Journalist exactly. that wrote it, maybe, you know, consider that. And it's incredibly powerful because um, it shines a light on things that really should be obvious. But I mean, one example was initially, you know, the FT has been around since 1888. And you have some pretty hardwired routines and habits in an institution that's been around that long. Um, and you combine that with the fact that producing a newspaper is this incredibly intricate choreography, um, very complex, and you've got to hit the deadlines. It's kind of risk averse as, a, as, a, as an organization and needs to be. And therefore, you get these um, routines and processes that are sort of hard baked and hard wired. But every now and again, the data will say, well, hold on a minute. Why are you publishing at this time of the day? And the answer is, well, because that's when the newspaper has to go to the train station to be distributed. But actually, it's not necessarily when readers want to be reading. Yeah. And of course, with digital, you can publish kind of whenever you want. You can match the rhythm of readership and therefore be, frankly, much more relevant and helpful. But I would also add you have to be, and we have to be, um, a little thoughtful and careful about how we use data. It's been incredibly powerful in the transformation of the FT. But ultimately, as a news organization, um, there are limits. Uh, we can't be led by data in terms of what we publish. And I think the role of really experienced journalists and editors. There are some news organizations that look at what's happening on the internet, uh, and then they deploy resources to follow that story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We don't want to do that. So our view is we have to be leading the news. We have very experienced correspondents, editors, columnists, and they kind of need to set and shape the agenda. So up to a point, data is incredibly powerful, but we must never lose sight of the fact that the the real value is in the brilliance of our journalists and editors who are you know, very well experienced, trained folks. Yeah, yeah actually to a certain extent, uh, I'm a little bit on the other side in the sense that I follow news a little bit yeah. because you know, making a video takes, takes a long time. So I, you know, it cannot really lead the news if, if you yes. take five days to produce a video. Yes. Um, but actually, yeah, no, that's why I read the Financial Times because right. you're the leader in that sense, right? You're, yeah. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, and I imagine you know because you gather all of this data, you learned also a lot more about sort of who reads the the Financial Times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, yeah. C can I ask a question? Like, who reads the Financial Times? What type of person is is your core audience, so to say? Well, it's changing quite okay. quite radically, um, and in ways that I'm very supportive of. I think one of the things that used to trouble me in the past um, was well, I think, and it it stems from the previous business and business model, because I think in the days of newspaper, newspapers, um, for advertisers, which was the key source of revenue, the key element of the business model, each newspaper had its kind of demographic. And it was, they were the most efficient way for advertisers to reach that demographic. 
um, before the days that digital blew everything up and you can reach all sorts of demographics in different ways at different times. But what that meant was, for that reason and other reasons, that I think the FT uh, kind of became synonymous with the sort of the city and, and, and men in suits, <laughs> if I'm bluntly, <laughs> to be blunt. Um, and also the sort of what became known as sort of Davos man. Um, and I feel and felt that that was constraining and, and in many ways not what we should be or wanted to be. And I think generally across the FT, there was a sense that we wanted to be, um, we wanted to have a much broader and more diverse audience. We wanted a global audience. We became a global organization, but to reach different groups of readers. Um, and you can do that very effectively with digital channels. And so we have a rapidly changing audience. Um, we've got a big focus on students. We have a sort of um, a student edition, which is effectively free. Um, and our view is that we want to build that habit of quality news with, with students. We have something like 4,000 schools all over the world now signed up. Um, we've been increasing um, our readership uh, among women. Um, obviously, we think there's an important responsibility and opportunity to build our readership um, with women. So the readership profile of the FT is changing quite dramatically. And also those new formats I mentioned, uh, audio, podcasts, video, film, are really good channels of reaching different kinds of audiences. We find in particular that um, younger readers really like the podcasts, they really like the video. Um, it's all FT quality, FT standard, and by FT journalists. Mm -hmm. There's just different ways of reaching different audiences. So it's tremendously exciting, and globally, of course, with digital, you don't need print sites everywhere. They're not good for the environment, they're cumbersome, um, the economics of print sites is not great. Um, now, obviously, the marginal cost of reaching new readers is kind of zero through di digital channels. Yeah. So, so what is, do you know by any chance what is the, the percentage uh, male-female at the moment? I, readers? Yeah, don't quote me on this, which is difficult because we're filming it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're now, well, this, for the weekend FT, I think it's probably about 30% plus female. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think the weekday is behind that, but, but increasing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And that and that um, you know came up from I don't know oh. eighty twenty or <laughs> what, what, what? a lot lower. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, I yeah. Think back in the day of <laughs> so-called Davos men, and uh, yeah, it was it was very small. Yeah. Okay. Small. Well, I mean, actually, that's you know, you should feel very good about that because uh, my viewers are ninety percent male, right. uh, <laughs> and I don't know why exactly, but uh, yeah. So I think that's yeah. that's quite uh, quite a feat that uh, that you have achieved. Um, yeah, okay, and, and you're saying, okay, you're also, um, you know, attracting more international viewers and students as well, and about students, um, well, that's actually when I started reading the FT 10 years ago or something, was free at my university, and this is also for, you know, anyone watching. Yeah. Many students don't even know that the FT is free through their university right. often, yes. so that's a tip, yeah. I guess. And, well, that's a big push. I think the other, one of the sort of canards, though, has been that... Um, there was this concept in, in news media that uh, young people wouldn't pay for um, news or information. Um, and I've always thought that's wrong. I think young people will pay for something they value, but they're also pretty smart. If they don't have to pay for it, they won't. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, and we are trying to expand um, to, build that, to build that habit, so we do have a, a big free program. And you also mentioned sort of the new channels that you're exploring, but I imagine, you know, if I looking at from a business sense, it's like a, a bit of a funnel, uh, I would yes. imagine. The, the idea is to get the subscriber Exactly. Ultimately. So uh, take one example. Our podcast now, we have a monthly audience of 2.4 million. It's a big monthly audience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's free. So, but the idea is to build the brand, build the association, so people come into contact with FT Journalism. They realize um, what we do and how we do it. And I also think they get to understand. I think sometimes there is... You know, these perceptions can be quite deep rooted. And I think, you know, the perception can be that the Financial Times is sort of hardcore finance news for, for men in the city. And I think once people start reading us and realize that our coverage is much broader um, and um, we cover arts, we cover politics, we cover tech, we cover a huge range of subjects that actually they begin to think, uh, yeah, this is actually relevant to me in a way I didn't sort of realize and the habit forms. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and you also cover a lot of geopolitics and you know, basically everything if you are interested in, in, in world affairs. Which We're very much in a news-rich environment now. So, you know, I mean, when I was on the editorial side, there'd be days 
where sometimes you'd struggle to think about, you know, what's the top story, what's on the front page. Now, um, it, there's just, it's a news rich environment which tells you, I think, about the state of the world and the multiple um, crises we have going on at the same time. So the challenge is prioritizing um, and making those decisions with the editorial team. Yeah, is it is it a more tumultuous world than it was? Because there's maybe also something that every everyone always says, sort of. I think <laughs> yes, for sure. And I would argue that it's um, what I've certainly experienced in my time at the FT is disruptions come much more frequently and reinforce each other. Even in the news industry, obviously we had the digital um, transformation revolution, then mobile came pretty quickly after that, and now we're all uh, facing the challenges and opportunities of, of AI and generative AI. And the speed and scale of these disruptions um, is definitely accelerating. Uh, and when you look in the sort of geopolitical um, spectrum, you know, I didn't think we expected to see the, the number and nature of wars um, that we're seeing now, you know, war, war in Europe, obviously a huge shock. So um, there's definitely a sense of more turbulence. And I, I think we're in a, one of the things, few things I remember from my f days of learning physics is you have a stable equilibrium and an unstable equilibrium. And I fear we're now in a, a zone of unstable equilibria where these upheavals lead, lead to more upheavals, um, which is generating a huge amount of demand for news. Um, and I think in that context, and in particular now with the very serious rise of disinformation, um, partly driven by the techniques and technologies of generative AI, the value of a trusted guide like the FT um, is more important than ever. I think, um, you know, whether it's deep fakes, um, hallucinations, misinformation, disinformation, deliberate or accidental, the, and I'll be talking about this later in, in my lecture here yeah. at Warwick, um, I think it's an unusually challenging and dangerous time where the value of trusted media has never been more important. Have you already seen this uh, happening in media? Because it's it's something you know, it was a hot topic, you know, when AI was introduced. But you know, also often people just talk about it like, oh, this could happen. But you've already seen it happen. It's definitely happening. Okay. There's no doubt. So if you look at elections, we've had recently the um, election in Bangladesh, the Slovakian election has been um, increasingly sophisticated um, deep fakes. Um, this isn't anything new, you know. Fake news goes way back in history, but the, the technology and the um, techniques is now so um, cheap and available uh, and rich that it's very easy to produce very convincing um, fake news. And, you know, I've experimented with this myself just to understand kind of what the threat is. And it's remarkably easy to produce very convincing um, fakes. And when you have half of the world going to the polls this year. There's 40 elections happening, including big ones obviously in the US and India. It's a very perilous time. But did they, when you speak about deepfakes, did they then Im impersonate politicians or like really already? Okay. Oh yeah, I mean there was an example just last week or the week before with Joe Biden rather convincingly calling on people not to vote in the New Hampshire primary. And frankly, um, it was, Pretty convincing. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. So yes, it's an incredibly troubling time and the availability and the low cost of these technologies is something we should all be very concerned about. So do you, like if we bring this then back to the, the media landscape, do you foresee that sort of the power of a trusted brand like, you know, like, like you have, which is one of the core competences I, I would yeah. guess, is will increase uh, due to this? Yes, I think that um, if you think about our key assets, it's our journalists who do an amazing job of reporting and analyzing the news, but the brand, which we've been building for 136 years, the reputation for trust, independence, balance, uh, integrity is absolutely um, vital because I think the news industry is going, is already facing another big phase of disruption. The big, one of the big challenges, of course, with generative AI is it's ability to summarize very succinctly at very low cost. And I guess there's a risk for a lot of publications that they'll become, uh, there'll be a cheaper alternative just for sort of general commodity news. So I think the need and the opportunity for the FT um, is to be differentiated by that trust, quality, integrity, but also the originality of what we do to try and keep one step ahead of this summarization 
engine that is going to be huge. Because I think um, your editor, chief editor, I'm not sure, but, uh, even posted at some point, hey, we're at FT, we do not use generative AI. Yeah. Is, that, uh, is that true in a sort of blanket way? Because, like, for example, you know, I, I sometimes use AI to uh, fact check myself. Or not fact check, but maybe like gr gr grammatically check myself or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, is that allowed at the FT or was this comment really like, we don't so use it for the news? We spent a long time thinking about this and really our editor-in-chief and a very uh, excellent and experienced journalist rightly has the view that the FT stands for human journalism. Um, and our journalism is created by um, expert journalists who are very experienced. And I think people often forget that journalism is a craft. You really have to learn it. You have to kind of develop the instincts and the judgment and, and all of that. Um, so we're very clear that our journalism is very based on our journalists who are human. <laughs> but having said that, on the business side, we see very significant opportunity to optimize the business model, to use AI techniques and technologies to um, facilitate marketing, to be more efficient, to... Um, we have one very good example is we're a global organization. Uh, we really believe in our global reach and the ability of AI to do first-rate translations um, enables us to reach readers in languages that they might be more comfortable with yep. uh, than, than English. So at the moment we have an English language edition, we have a Chinese language edition, but um, with AI, and we've just launched at the end of last year, a new digital edition, which automatically translates into, I think it's 35 languages. And as a language student, I've been trying to learn Japanese for the best part of a decade. I use AI programs to help me learn. And frankly, they're really very, very um, powerful. So there are definitely very significant applications um, from AI to help the FT on the business side, but that's a distinct side from obviously producing the journalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I'm very happy to hear that because you know I think almost everybody you know tr when it first was released tried GPT everything that you know you're usually doing. Can GPT do this? But I tried it with some of the you know the stories about what's happening in the world, economics, and it's full of nonsense. It's, it's really, it's, and I think so. it's interesting because you're a journalist. Convincing right? nonsense. So. Yeah, um, but I think sometimes you almost need a journalist brain to um, realize that it's making a mistake. That's the danger. A lot of people may not realize, and you know, I you know I went up Mount Fuji last year, and when I got back down, I asked an AI program what the record was for climbing Mount Fuji and coming back down, and it said two hours and 50 minutes. And I thought, well, hold on, that's clearly impossible. <laughs> you know, it took me like a day. So I went back to the program and to its credit, the, actual, the program apologized and said it hadn't checked its sources and then gave me a, a correct answer. But you need a sort of almost a journalist instinct to check that. So there's still lots of deep flaws in AI. It's only as good as the inputs and it's still working on the inputs, but it will get better and better and better, no doubt. Um, and therefore, the need for premium and quality journalist brands is to stay, stay ahead of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, like, you know, in my space, uh, purely on, on YouTube or on the film side, also on TikTok, uh, I definitely have seen a flood of uh, AI generated content. And I'm, I've really also been thinking, like, to me, it, it helps that I'm on camera myself yes. as a person, uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. But I've, I have some you know, competitors or other YouTube channels that are faceless. And yeah. for them, I'm really worrying because you know, I've, I've definitely already seen lots of AI videos that are just very convincing, super, like where I take four days to research. Yes. They, they can just do, do 20 I mean, stories in that time. I was reading a study last week or the week before, and I can't remember the source, but it was predicting um, that within two to three years, most of the material on the net will be, you know, generated by generative AI, which is, you know, when you consider the volumes and the scale, that's that's pretty um, pretty striking. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I wonder if uh, indeed people are just going to move then more and more to okay, or at least hopefully most people uh, to. I just read FT economists uh, like tr money macro tr uh, trusted sources. Uh, and that might actually be very good for, for you as well then, right? Yeah, I think there's a big opportunity, but it's where the economics will really um, be significant because these programs will be very cheap or verging to free, I guess. So there will be a lot of available commodity information. But I think if you want 
reliable original information, the value of those trusted brands like the FT will will increase. Yeah, and uh, if we can circle back to sort of the subscription-based model, yes. mm. um, have you also noticed, because you know, I was wondering when you were saying we've moved from this print-based model to a subscription-based model. I think that's now the core, right, of yes. the FT. Mm. I was wondering, you know, when you said that, do, does that mean that you now feel less pressure to be sensationalist in the sense that, like in print, I can imagine it's more like it's more like free media. It's not free, but yeah. uh, because you pay per edition, so it, it maybe makes more sense to have a very sensationalized headline to stick out. Whereas yeah. now you have your have have you noticed that? Is that well, culturally and strategically, we've never felt any need to be sensationalist. It's quite the opposite, I think, precisely because we've seen the world go sensationalist. It's kind of reinforced our conviction. Um, which was kind of very strong anyway, to be reliable, accurate, balanced, and fair. Um, and I do think that's another differentiator, because you're right, you know, um, social media business models and big tech business models um, optimize for attention. And we all know that the sort of limbic cortex, maybe we don't all know, <laughs> actually, the limbic cortex, the so-called lizard brain, um, very much um, people will respond to sensationalist news yeah. almost out of instinct. So it's a very good way of um, attracting attention and clicks, and that's what drives the, the business model of social media and big tech. It's an advertising-based attention model. So with a subscription model and an engagement model, um, those dimensions of trust and integrity, um, again, differentiate us. So we've never felt an editorial temptation or a business temptation to, to chase eyeballs in that way because you, know, you might have a, a quick win um, but we're in this for the long-term sustainable engagement with uh, readers who trust us. But are you still not exposed to it a little bit in the sense that uh, I, I assume, like I often come across your articles, even though I just also have the app, on my uh, Google News feed, for example. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I, I imagine, you know, that's also important for you because that brings in new subscribers yep. uh, at yep. some point. And there, um, there's this big YouTube channel about science who, mm -hmm. who said, what we do is, they called it legit bait. And that's also uh, something that I try to do. So it's like, be a little bit sensationalist, yeah. but only uh, you know, if you can actually deliver on that promise. Yeah. Uh, do you do that a little bit? No, I mean, you're, well, firstly, you're right. That Google is an important channel, so we do put stories up on Google News. But I think our, um, our view is that quality journalism, um, done in a way that's relevant, um, readable, and in many respects, very entertaining. So whether we, the use of video, the use of data visualization, these of graphics. Um, that's baity enough. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, then, you know, finally I was wondering, we've talked about the business model a little bit. Mm. So we talked about uh, subscriptions being important. Obviously, still a lot of people also just buy the print. Uh, yes. But you do a lot more, right? I was yeah. on your website, and I've seen this also with other outlets. I've also seen this with The Economist, for example. So, for example, uh, there's now more of an emphasis on organizing events, I yes. think, yeah. uh, and um, consulting, uh, yeah. I've seen, I think, yeah. uh, video. Uh, can you comment a little bit on that? Like, yes. That's yeah. also a new thing, right? Yeah. The media is moving in that yeah. direction. You've definitely done your homework because that's absolutely true. Um, so our events business, our FT Live, is one of our fastest growing divisions. It's growing double digits. Um, and um, we have a consulting Division two, which really takes the lessons that we've learned in our digital transformation, and we bear many scars from this journey, and try to help particularly other publishers, but also other organizations too, on that journey. Um, and I think our view is generally that um, our readers and our audience um, have other relevant uh, interests and connections. And you know, obviously, business people like to network and connect. So our FT Live uh, events and forums bring bring people together physically. Uh, obviously during COVID it was um, online, but just that sense of connecting and engaging and sharing experiences um, is a powerful uh, connector of business people around FT subjects, bringing FT experts and journalists into the discussion debate. So it's kind of like a, a multi-channel, multi-platform model, uh, all based on um, brilliant journalism. So that's the sort of unifying force of everything. But you know, I think people, and you know, we've talked a lot about digital, but I'm a huge believer in print. Our print business is um, robust, stable. Uh, the weekend FT is actually growing. So I think you know, the same reader um, at different points of the day, at, at different rhythms, has different interests and demands. They might 
want to spend some time with the app, they may want to go to a live event, they may want to watch some video, uh, and as long as we're available at the right time in the right way on the platforms that they want to consume us, um, that works. And how does that work then with the, the events? Is it like around a theme or something? Yes. Or? Yeah, so, you know, um, we, we will take, you know, a, a theme like energy and we'll, you know, we'll convene world experts in energy or sustainable energy, uh, including our own experts. Um, and there'll have be discussions and obviously the audience engages in questions and answers. And then around those events, you have opportunities to network. It's a pretty... Um, a dynamic and effective format, and yeah. they're global. Everything we do is global. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, because, um, yeah, you used to be rather British, right? Yeah. But how, how much, think, like, how, what does the global distribution look like? Yeah, so I think the key thing in any business and any successful business is differentiation. And I think the two things that differentiate us, we've talked, or I've talked about the quality and integrity and uh, non-partisan nature of the FT. The other big differentiator is global. Um, and we were the first news organization to really publish outside our home market. We set up a, the Frankfurt edition back in the 70s, um, and that was the start of our European expansion. After that, we went to the US, set up a US edition, and I personally launched the Asia edition in 2003. So now our UK um, audience is, so we now sell significantly more um, newspapers outside the UK. Our subscriber base is significantly greater outside the UK. I think we're one of the few publications where its um, audience is bigger outside its home market. The UK is still hugely important to us. It's um, our roots, um, but we're thoroughly global in outlook, coverage, and audience. Yeah, okay. So uh, to round off uh, our chat, um, I would like to ask you, um, why should people who maybe, you know, look at a Money and Macro Talks interview, mm. Um, because, you know, you mentioned uh, people find it more and more important to pay for, or are, are very willing to pay for news. I think that, that's one yeah. of the things we talked about first. Mm -hmm. And yet, mm -hmm. uh, to pay for the FT is quite a substantial sum, right? It's a relatively expensive <laughs> newspaper. Uh, so why should, should people, uh, especially now, uh, if they're at the moment consuming news for free, yeah. also uh, subscribe to the FT? Yeah, well, I guess I'd make a couple of points. Firstly, and um, I would argue we're not at all expensive. The, the price of the FT is less than um, a double espresso from Starbucks. Um, so, um, or around about the same. <laughs> and, yeah, and well, any high street coffee chain <laughs> okay. tends to be around In there. London, maybe. And when you think about the value complexity of what we do, I think it's a pretty fair, fair deal. But uh, I would also argue that the value of what we do becomes ever more important because for the reasons we've talked about, the, um, the state of the world, um, the need for reliable information and trust information about what's going on in this context of sensationalism, uh, fake news becoming ever more prevalent and sophisticated because of technology and, and uh, generative AI just makes the value uh, of the FT ever greater. Um, and I would also argue beyond the value, there's something really quite wonderful and special about quality journalism and, and news done right and done well. Um, so to be honest, I have no issue at all with the price. Um, I personally <laughs> think we are, should be charging a lot more. But <laughs> Please don't. But, but uh, now, I think this is an important point actually, just to maybe to finish with. One of the nice things we have is that we're owned by Nikkei uh, of Japan yeah. and they're a private company owned by their employees, that enables them to take a very long-term view. And their priority is not profit maximization, it's what we think about as mission maximization, which is to create quality journalism and to reach as many people as possible in as many places. And I think that's what really motivates um, people at the FT, whether on the editorial side or the business side. Clearly we need to make a profit, we need to be sustainable, um, particularly in a world of such turbulence. Um, but really what we're trying to do is to maximize the mission, not the profit. Right, I'm happy to hear that. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for this, this uh, interview. For me, what really stood out was sort of that um, you've become 
data driven with your stories, so to say. That that is really something I just didn't consider when you know when you go digital because like many there's many news digital outlets, yeah. but if you're free, you don't have information about exactly. the people who are, are yeah. watching you, right? So that was really something I, I had never thought about before. Uh, and I thought it was also really interesting to hear a little bit more about how the business of news works and that it also can still be very well combined with delivering quality journalism and not succumbing to sensationalism. And that's hopefully some, you know, something I would love to replicate uh, myself. Um, yeah, and finally, yeah, uh, I will definitely continue reading the FT, quoting the FT, uh, if you're a student, uh, check if your university offers it for free. Yes. Uh, and otherwise. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And otherwise, um, yeah, I can recommend it to anyone. And thank you so much for, uh, for talking to me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jaren.